So I ran into a really peculiar uh, symptom today. <clears throat> I modded a DMG with a backlight and a bivert and had a really interesting symptom. So the A button, B button, and D-pad all work. You can hold A or B in any direction and they work. However, if you hold A and B at the same time, the right direction pad moves the character to the left. So it does the opposite of what you want it to do. All other directions work fine. Uh, this was really peculiar uh, and I've never seen it quite like this before. Um, so first we go ahead, we take a look at the schematic and you can see in the bottom left hand corner we have the schematic for the buttons. Um, you'll see A, B, start, select, left, right, up, down as well as the corresponding pins to the CPU. I'll zoom in on that. And you can see P15 matches up with P15 on the CPU, so on and so forth. Uh, you can see them marked there. So either the issue is going to be with the CPU uh, or it's going to be with um, the diodes, which you can see labeled DA1 through 4. Uh, so when we look up the diode schematic, it is the Dan 15, uh, excuse me, Dan 215, which is a three pin diode. Um, the DAP 215 would be the opposite with a common positive, uh, but the Dan 215 has a common negative pin in the middle. And then two diodes separating the common from the left and right, um, which you can see here. So what that means is when we go to test, um, we can do the diode function and we will have our negative uh, lead on the middle pin and we will have our positive lead on either pin. And we should be seeing a voltage drop of around 700 to 725 uh, millivolts. And uh, so that's what we're gonna test for. The only problem about these four diodes on the LCD screen is they're behind the, uh, excuse me, the LCD board. They're behind the LCD screen. Um, so in order to reach the solder joints, we're going to have to remove the screen completely. Um, you can find the four diodes when you look at the back of the LCD board. You'll see four black rectangular squares. And uh, they do have text on them that says Dan215, and then it'll have a number at the end, which is uh, like a batch letter. Um, so it'll say Dan215 space C or D or F or whatever, depending on the batch it was in. But it'll say Dan215 on all four of them. So what we're going to do is um, we are going to remove the screen first and foremost. We are going to flux up the pins um, and you see I just removed the little staple that holds the vertical ribbon cable securely to the LCD board uh, so you just unfold it at the back um, press up with the soldering iron on the one soldered side of it and use some pliers to pull it up I'm then going to remove the two screws there holding down the ribbon cable and I'm going to flux up the pins for the vertical side of the ribbon cable and put a little bit of chip quick onto the pins. <coughs> chip quick is a desoldering solder uh, and it's a low temperature melting solder that allows you to remove surface mount components with multiple pins using a typical soldering iron and using a low enough temperature that you're not damaging um, the ribbon cable itself or the chip if you're removing a chip. Um, the key thing to note about it is Chip Quick is a desoldering tool, not a soldering tool. So when you're done uh, removing the screen, you need to remove all the Chip Quick. It's not something you want in your solder. It will, if it mixes in with your standard solder, it's going to lower the soldering temp, uh, I mean the melting temp, uh, and it'll also make it much more brittle and more likely to crack down the line. But anyway, so got a, it fluxed up, got chip quick on there, a little piece of it. And uh, you can see I have a pair of pliers underneath the LCD board to support the ribbon cable. And I'm just melting up that solder and lifting gently with a uh, screwdriver. 
Now you can see I'm wicking the chip quick away with the tip of my soldering iron. Um, I personally am an avid fan of using a knife tip on my soldering iron. I pretty much don't use anything else ever. Um, but the key thing to note is that my soldering tip isn't actually touching the pins of the ribbon cable. Um, I've got a neat little solder blob of chip quick and I'm moving that back and forth, but my soldering iron doesn't touch the pins. These pins are very delicate, and so that's a key part of this. Um, you can see I've removed, there is one black screw holding the horizontal cable down. Uh, now I'm fluxing it up again, and we're gonna do the same process, but a little piece of chip quick. Um, the more you get used to using chip quick, the less you actually need to use. Um, I use about a third the length of the pins that I need to pull up so uh, just a little piece of chip quick should be able to do it and I have my iron set at 200 degrees so that I don't risk damaging the chip on flex uh, on the ribbon cable so now that I've removed it I'm just doing my best to wick away any excess chip quick off of the pins so basically I will clean my iron tip uh, and then move it in the direction that the pins are going um, and pick up any excess chip quick on it uh, the best practice to do uh, which I'll be showing you on the board later is to now retin those pins with standard solder and then wick them away and retin and wick it away uh, really getting rid of the chip quick as best as you can so now I'm gonna put the screen into the plastic frame for it. Uh, that plastic frame has three clips on the back which you just pop off the LCD board. I'm gonna do that to protect the screen and the ribbon cable of it as it's very sensitive while I work on the LCD board. Uh, again, I am using my flush uh, trimmers to put the LCD board on. Um, that way I can put pressure on the board without damaging uh, the ribbon cable that connects it to the motherboard and still just tinning and, and wicking away excess chip quick from the pins put these all to the side And we are going to set our multimeter to diode test, um, which on my multimeter is the same as continuity. Uh, in continuity, it will beep. In diode, it will actually produce a reading. You can see here are the four diodes uh, on the back of the LCD board. So um, in diode mode, uh, with the negative test lead on the common ground pin, which is number two in the middle, and the positive on the number one or number three pin, left or right, um, you will get a voltage drop that should be between 700 and 725 millivolts. Um, however, if you reverse the leads and have the positive on the middle uh, pin and the negative on one or two, you should get a reading of one, which is showing that electricity is not flowing. Um, now, as I test this, I find that DA3 um, uh, is shorted, and there's actually a little bit of solder that's connecting uh, the middle ground and one of the side pins. So uh, this is not something that I had actually touched. I don't know if someone else was in the system or if... Uh, I don't know what the hell happened here, but... Uh, the two pins are shorted, so and they shouldn't be. So I'm going to go ahead and desolder uh, that excess solder that's shorting the two pins. And then I will go ahead and reflow uh, the solder and, and test the diode and see if the diode is, is good. So I'm here, I'm adding some flux. And now I am going to get my tip against the through hole and the lead of the component, heat it up for a second or two, and then I'm going to touch solder 
to the through hole and the lead on the opposite side of the tip. So the through hole, the, the solder never actually touches the tip. Um, you're making sure that the through hole and the lead is properly heated and then you're touching the solder to the other side and uh, that will melt and with flux um, that will create a beautiful solder joint. Now I'm testing it and you can see it's slowly getting up to, to towards the right um, uh, value. It's almost like watching a capacitor charge up, but not the same thing. Um, it seems to be stalling around 680 and uh, probably work, but I just, I, I don't like that anyway. So I'm going to replace that one for sure. Um, and uh, then I also test DA4 and I find that it's open. So I'm actually going to end up replacing both DA3 and DA4. So thankfully I work on a lot of DMGs and I have a lot of spare parts. So I pull out my test LCD board. Um, and uh, I am verifying that the diodes on this are working within range, which they are. And I'm going to go ahead and swap them uh, onto my customer's board. So here I'm fluxing up my solder braid and I'm going to remove the diodes on the customer's board. <laughs> Using the bevel of my knife tip, I'm going to press against the solder wick, um, and I'm actually doing my best, best to have this, the knife tip over all three pins of the diode, and I'm keeping my knife tip in place and slowly pulling the solder wick through um, as I f fully saturate the wick with uh, solder. So most of them come, have, most of the solder is off, however, I can't quite pull it out. So I'm going to use my um, knife tip to bend the leads of the diode uh, so they're straight above. You can see I'm kind of flicking them up. Uh, and now I can just pull the diode through. I'm going to do the same thing for DA4. And... Uh, as I do that, uh, I just got to say this was so interesting. And it was a shame because I sent the Game Boy out to the customer. And I had fully tested it. I always stress test it, run it for a few battery cycles, and make sure that everything's still working well. I had done all of that. And A worked, B worked, the directional pad worked, select, start, uh, ran Pokemon for ages. Had Everything was testing great. I never thought to test holding A, B at the same time, and the directional pads. Um, what ended up happening is we sent it to the customer, and he was playing Donkey Kong. And uh, that move set, when he held A, B, and the right directional pad at the, all at the same time, uh, brought up this issue where it would do the exact opposite. And uh, so it, it was first time this has ever happened to me. Um, but... Uh, very interesting and I learned a lot from it and now obviously this will be part of my regular testing so I'm sharing this with you guys for two reasons one in case you come across the same issue whether it's with the DMG or uh, a controller really of any kind how I went about figuring out the issue um, and that you can even if you don't know the problem initially and have never encountered it Pull up the schematic and look at where, how do you say it, fucking f follow the path from the symptom until you find um, the component that's not testing correctly. So you just follow the path to a component on the schematic, test that component, does it work? If it does, keep following it. So now I'm double checking the diodes on the donor board. And getting ready to remove them.
you know, a lot of people complain about using solder braid. Uh, it's one of my favorite desoldering tools. Um, part of that is because I use a knife tip on my soldering iron uh, almost religiously. Um, but <coughs> I have a desoldering gun, and it's all right. Granted, it's it's a cheap Chinese gun, um, and if you maintain it, it'll work fine. But I end up using braid for most of the stuff I do. Um, and um, braid or chip quick to desolder. Um, so pretty much everything I do is done with an iron uh, and a knife tip. Um, really solder wick is a great way to desolder if you use it right. And that's uh, retin the pin or the pins. Um, flux up the solder wick and use the bevel of the knife tip to heat up a large plane of the solder wick and um, as the solder wick saturates slide it through um, underneath the bevel of the knife tip and you'll see you really pull up all the solder pretty effectively and I know I mentioned this earlier but uh, just to reiterate Getting a good solder joint is about having the through hole and the lead of the component hot enough on their own to melt the solder and about having flux. So if you flux up the, the through hole and the lead or the pad and the pin, you're then going to touch your iron tip to the through hole and the pin um, and then you're going to apply the solder from the opposite side um, and then allow the pin and the through hole itself to melt the solder. I'm just placing the diodes in. Um, because the leads were bent uh, in order to hold them into place initially, uh, I kind of have to get them bent back straight. Um, but this is the other great thing about flux is if you have the board fluxed up already, um, the components just stick into place. So once you get through the through hole, they hold themselves pretty much. And same thing, I'm hitting from the opposite side that I am applying the solder to. You don't want to put too much solder. Uh, you should have enough that you have a, a solid connection, but it should be concave not convex I think I've got that right in other words you should see a curve and it should gently curve from the through hole to the lead um, going in but not a curve going out so it should not be a ball or a blob it should look more like the face of a wave as it starts to curl if that makes any fucking sense Ugh, excuse me. Ah, so damn, excuse me. So what I'm doing right now is desoldering all of the chip quick remaining on the pads for the screen's ribbon cables on the LCD board. So I am using my solder braid to remove all of that and then retinning it um, to mix any leftover chip quick with fresh solder. Then removing that solder again with solder braid and then I'll retin the pads a final time in order to get a um, good connection with the uh, screen to ribbon cable down the road so basically what's happening is um, you have chick quick on the pads which great desoldering tool terrible solder um, it's brittle it cracks um, relatively quickly um, and it has a very low melting point 
So really good for soldering, but really bad, or really good for desoldering, but really bad for soldering. So I removed it once with um, the solder braid, but there's still going to be a coating of chip quick on the pad itself, even though I've removed just about all of it. So then I retin the pad with, with standard solder, and that's gonna mix the chip quick into the standard solder and dilute it. Then I'm gonna hit it again with the uh, soldering wick, and removing that will leave a minuscule amount on the pad. If you want to be thorough, you will do this a couple times. But uh, doing this at least once is, should be enough. Um, and now I'm going to retin it again. And it uh, should be ready to go. Uh, we just need to clean the board free of all of that flux that I use. So I'm going to pour some isopropyl alcohol and get a clean Q-tip. And down the road, I'll get a slab of paper towel. Oh, and a toothbrush. So I'm starting with the toothbrush dipped in the isopropyl alcohol. And what I'm doing is all of that flux that has started to dry up from all the work we've done, the toothbrush is going to uh, loosen it. The problem is the toothbrush and the alcohol uh, is twofold. The bristles of the toothbrush are going to get filled up with alcohol, uh, with flux. Uh, so you'll want to clean your toothbrush as well. Um, but then the other problem is that it, the alcohol isn't removing the flux. The alcohol in the toothbrush is getting it off of the board in the sense that it's not stuck anymore but really what i've just done is i've broke it free from its position but i've spread it all over the board so now i'm going to come back with the dry end of a q-tip and remove as much as i can then i'm going to get isopropyl on the fresh side of the q-tip and i'm going to re-go over the board um, everywhere that i went with the toothbrush and uh Fuck, I just spilled my alcohol there, but that's okay. I can get more. And then I'll use a new fresh dry tip, uh, Q-tip, and pick up that alcohol. Um, so basically what's going to happen is the alcohol will pick up the flux, but then the alcohol will evaporate, and it's going to leave the flux there. So you want to go back and forth between hitting it with alcohol and then hitting it with something dry to, to absorb the flux alcohol mixture before the alcohol evaporates. Uh, so you just go back and forth with that a few times. And then once you're pretty much done, um, you hit it with alcohol one more time. And then I hit it with a paper towel. The part that is a pain in the butt is all of the through hole leads um, from all the components on the board are going to stick little bits of paper towel fiber. Uh, so you just have to go back and kind of pick those off. Uh, so I hit it with air and pinch off any um, fibers stuck to the, the pins. Cleanliness is key and it's particularly important to clean this up uh, because um, and do a good job of cleaning it up because as you hit it with the alcohol and the flux and alcohol mix, it really spreads around the board and then dries, leaving a f like flux residue over the board. And so that can cause like the buttons where the conductive silicone pads go over um, to be sticky, uh, which is going to cause button issues in and of itself. So now that's all clean, I'm going to take the screen frame and pop those three clips back into place. We're going to take the screen and now um, the and there's a few important things. You want to be very delicate, but you want to make sure that the screen ribbon cables are lined up properly. Um, so there's a hole for a little tiny screw, um, which I actually lost here. Uh, turns out it was stuck to the back of the speaker, but uh, thankfully I have extra, so I went ahead and got an extra. All right, so I've got the screw, and I almost made a pretty rookie mistake, and I almost went ahead and started screwing it back in to re-solder. Um, 
But this is the last opportunity you have to clean the screen without damaging the ribbon cable or at least risking damaging the ribbon cable. So let's go back over, make sure no flux or dust or fingerprints or anything got inside of the screen while we were working on it. Um, I always desolder the screen anytime I backlight it or obviously uh, to do a cap change or test these or change these diodes. Um, but you want to do it one time. You don't want to do it multiple times. Um, you want to be very delicate with these screens. So now I want the alignment to be good. So I'm going to just turn that little set screw a little bit. We're not going to tighten it all the way. We're going to close the screen and then open it up just a little bit and pinch that rim cable down. And you'll see there's um, two pins on the left side that are grounded. I'm just going to tack those down into place. Um, and once those are tacked into place, um, I'm going to take a um, flat uh, a flathead screwdriver and I'm going to kind of hold the ribbon cable down into place. Um, since we didn't screw the screw down all the way, um, the ribbon cable will be up a little bit. So I'm going to use my flathead and um, hold the ribbon cable down to a good position. I know you can't really see it with this camera angle, but uh, I'm not a, really a content creator, so it's the best we got. Uh, and I am going to go back and um, get all the solder joints nice and neat. And I am just gently brushing with the bevel of my knife tip over about three to four pins at the same time, moving outward in the same direction the pins are facing. Very gentle not to really tug on the pins at all. And uh, now I have the horizontal screen nicely soldered in. And so I'm going to close up the screen and do the same thing. I'm going to take uh, one of the little set screws for the vertical cable and uh, I'm going to screw that partially in. And then I'm also going to um, get a kind of angled uh, tool. I don't even know what it's really called um, to hold the ribbon cable into place. Um, because we have two prongs on the plastic screen holder uh, that kind of lift up the vertical ribbon cable. So that makes the ribbon cable want to pry away from the board. So uh, we're going to use this angled tool here. Um, Now, the reason I'm doing this first uh, is because uh, I'm going to get everything clean, but I'm actually going to put the backlight underneath the screen. Um, the screen was never meant to have a backlight beneath it. It had uh, two foam, two double-sided adhesive fo like foam pieces um, that support the back of the screen. Well, they're not the exact same thickness as the screen, so I want the backlight underneath there so that when I solder the vertical ribbon cable in place, it's soldered in a position that's not gonna put extra tension on the pins due to the difference in thickness of the backlight. So I get the backlight into place and I'll get the polarizer done. I'm sprinkling baby powder onto the polarizer on both sides. I'm gonna take my can of air and Pointing away from the Game Boy, I'm going to get rid of all the extra baby powder that just went near it. Uh, I wasn't thinking when I did this video I should have done that with the Game Boy completely far away. Um, but I was trying to make a nice video for all you lovely folks. And now I'm just getting rid of the excess baby powder. And what's left is just a very thin uh, layer of baby powder that's not visible and it will help prevent the polarizer from sticking to the backlight 
or the screen itself causing Newton rings. It's not a guarantee. Newton ring can still pop up, but it is good practice. Of course, since it's a biverted unit, we're orienting the polarizer so that the screen looks dark when off. Now we're gonna support the LCD board with our flush trimmers so that we don't put any pressure onto the ribbon cable, but we'll put the pressure on the trimmers and the board instead. And I'm just gonna give it a bit of flux here. And I'm screwing the set screw in partially, not all the way. I don't want too much tension there. Um, and then I am going to get these angled, uh, whatever the fuck they're called, tool um, to hold the ribbon cable at a good place. Um, and I am going to tack down the pins first. Once I get them tacked down, Um, I'll go back and make the joints nice and neat across each pin. Again, I'm using the bevel of my knife tip and moving in the same direction as the pins. Now I'm putting in the batteries to test, make sure I didn't ruin the screen cause any damage to it looks good no lines in it putting it in the game make sure that the game is functioning properly and I'm, I'm gonna test these buttons and see if changing out those diodes actually solved the issue So I'll just place the conductive silicone pads above the uh, button pads. Unfortunately, I have two other Game Boys that are in stress testing and they're running Pokemon games and so the only Pokemon game I have available to test this one on uh, has a dead battery so I have to get through Professor Oak's little speech before I can test the buttons. Honestly, I would edit and fast forward this part, but um, it's just, it's very difficult for me. I don't have a content creator set up. Um, I have a cell phone and I'm editing this on my cell phone. So I'm just going to save myself the time. But I'm seeing that everything seems to be working. So it does look like swapping the diodes has fixed the problem. And uh, I know I was just telling you about being lazy. I actually filmed this segment, putting it back together once I knew it was working um, in time lapse. So that's why this section is fast forwarded, but not the last one. And testing it again. And it looks good.